Squid Game is a show that needs no introduction, but here's one anyway. It was the biggest show of 2021, became a genuine household name, and stands as one of the most impressive TV productions in recent memory. This video is kind of a follow up to my last Squid Game video, so I'm not going to go too in depth on my opinion on the show overall, but if you didn't see that video, here's a wee recap. I fucking love Squid Game. Joe, don't tell me anything fair. Squid Game. Flashback, don't tell me. You're great to see ever. And I do. I love Squid Game. Look, I've even got a keychain and a poster. Like I'm fucking 10 years old. And a lot of people felt the same. There were also a lot of people who hated it. But it seemed like the majority of people, at least from what I saw, agreed that the show peaked around episode 6 before falling apart in the last three episodes. Now, if that's how you feel about Squid Game, I'm not here to tell you that you're wrong. And I understand I'm probably up against it here, but I hope that, in explaining why I disagree, I can change some people's minds to help them enjoy the show's final act as much as I did. There are obviously loads of different issues that someone could have with Squid Game, but in my experience, there seem to be four main issues that people stick on. Jun Ho and the Frontman, the VIPs, the Il Nam twist, and Gi Hoon's behaviour after the games. The main issue people seem to have with Jun Ho's part of the story is that they feel like it amounts to nothing. Jun Ho sneaks onto the island, into the game, gets a confessional from one of the VIPs, tries to get the info to his captain, gets shot, the end. But Jun Ho's look behind the curtain at the operation of the games exists for a reason. I said in my last video that Jun Ho being our eyes on the inside adds a level of intensity that wouldn't have been there if we'd just been following regular guards. It would have been a break from the tension of the rest of the show, but combining the permanent threat of death that Junho was under with the potential for bloodshed in the bunk room gave Squid Game a constant dread that makes a real difference to the show. There's no respite anywhere. It's all mental. But putting Junho to one side, why does there have to be a focus on the behind closed doors operation of the games in the first place? Shouldn't the show just have focused on the players? These questions make sense if the show was just a one and done series, but with the confirmation of series 2 and the return of the frontman, the behind the scenes action of series 1 becomes pretty crucial. The frontman reappearing in series 2 means the events involving him and Junho might not be the dead end they appear to be in the series. I'm not the first person to point this out, but we never actually saw Junho die. And in a broader sense, the audience having an understanding of the operation of the Squid Game, the hierarchy, the international reach, and the purpose for its existence means that a second series can hit the ground running and explore the world behind the Squid Game without needing to do some kind of exposition dump at the start of the series. We're already familiar with that world and ready to drop back in for a deeper look. But after the introduction of the VIPs, some people might not be so interested in that deeper look. The VIPs were probably the thing people were most vocal about hating in series 1, and it's easy to see why. What convinced you? Too bit so much on number 69. Oh, it's uh, such a beautiful number! 69! <laughs> oh, you dirty dog. The immediate defence people have made here is that we're supposed to hate the VIPs. They're villains and they're meant to be despised. But that doesn't completely excuse the VIPs, because a lot of people had an issue with their existence at all, to the point that it actually hurt their enjoyment of the show. I think it's ultimately subjective, and I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth. But there's another aspect to the VIPs that I think fuels this hatred of their very inclusion. When the VIPs are introduced, it seems like the entire purpose of the game is just to entertain them, which can obviously feel a bit underwhelming, when all the bloodshed and heartbreak is just in service of giving these clowns a bit of fun, especially coming right after the marble game. And I think that's part of what upsets people. Maybe they thought it was a poor answer to the mystery of the show, and an unsatisfying ultimate villain. But I think the VIPs are a lot more tolerable on a rewatch, when we know that there's a higher power at play, and that the VIPs are just spectators in a larger plan. But if there's a higher power running things, why have the VIPs at all? There are a bunch of interesting answers to this question. Like I said, the VIPs being different nationalities hints at the international reach of the games, and the existence of other similar games abroad. The games this edition have been amazing. Right, the contest in Korea was the best. Thank you. I believe the next game will exceed your expectations. Well, that's why we came all this way. 
A lot of people have theorised that they're meant to be us, a meta reflection of people who enjoy watching death games for entertainment. Within the logic of the story, they're presumably the financiers of the game, at least to some degree. I know Il Nam is a billionaire, but I don't care how rich you are. You run this game for however many years it's been going, handing out those cash prizes, hiring staff and paying hush money. You need some investors. And where's the evidence that they're not the sole reason for the existence of the games? Well, aside from the eventual reveal that Ilnam is the mastermind, there are clues that point towards the ultimate unimportance of the VIPs. Between all of the games, do you notice anything different about the Glass Bridge game? It stands out pretty obviously against the rest of them, since the others are clearly designed to evoke classic childhood fun times. Whereas the bridge game, aside from not immediately being recognisable as a kid's game, is also really garishly designed. The cavernous room is lit up like a sketchy cabaret, obviously designed to cater to the taste of these rich pricks that pay to watch desperate people suffer. Of all the rounds, this game is specifically designed for them, like whoever convinced them to invest in the games, guaranteed them some gruesome deaths and betrayal, and this game was designed around that promise. And that kinda answers another issue people have with the show, the glass explosion that leads to Sabiok's death. The players are promised that the games are all totally fair, that everyone had an equal chance of winning, something that's proven wrong on many occasions. A lot of people have pointed out that this is an obvious criticism of capitalist society, where the line is that everyone has an equal chance to succeed and make something of themselves, an obvious oversimplification. And the glass explosion that kills Sabiok shuts that idea down, showing that social lie for what it is, on top of being a nice big fireworks show for the gleeful VIPs, only the audience to a grander purpose. And what is that grand purpose? In stories that feature both, a lot of writers are keen to make a clear distinction between billionaires and millionaires. The best example of this I can think of is the second game in Kaiji, The Brave Man Road. This game sees Kaiji and a bunch of other players walking along narrow steel beams in a contest to reach the end first, a scene pretty reminiscent of the Glass Bridge game. A jeering audience of millionaires watches on as the men walk atop a terrifying drop, having a whale of a time as the contestants push each other off or accidentally fall. In this first round, the drop is long enough to seriously injure the players, but chances are that most of them will survive. However, in the second round, falling off the beam means certain death, and in this round, those loudmouth millionaires are nowhere to be seen. Instead, the audience is a much more sinister breed of person. These onlookers, like the ultimate villain of Kaiji, are the ultra-rich, who've subsequently had their perspectives on life and people warped, and who now get a deeper, sicker, and more meaningful thrill out of watching people lose their life in the pursuit of money. And in Squid Game, this same distinction exists, though it's not shown right away. The VIPs treat the game like an extreme luxury, to be enjoyed like a sport. But the games mean something much more serious to Ilnam. For him, the Squid Game is about proving something to himself, something about the nature of people. Ilnam believes that people are fundamentally selfish, and not content just to watch, as the Squid Game brings out this behaviour in people. Ilnam goes so far as to create opportunities himself for people to be selfish. This desire of Ilnam's, to foster selfishness and eradicate altruism, shines a different light on all of his actions throughout the series. Take the marble game for example. Ilnam pushes Gihun into a corner, bringing him down to his last marble. And this is an important moment for Ilnam. After all of the selfless acts that Gihun's done over the series, especially to Ilnam himself, Ilnam sees Gihun's kindness as an affront to his beliefs about the nature of people. If Gihun isn't naturally selfish, if he's a good person, does that mean Ilnam's convictions are wrong? This is why, in this moment, Ilnam fakes a memory loss episode to provide Gihun the opportunity to be selfish. <laughs> It's a carefully crafted trap to lure Gihun to the dark side of not just trying to survive, but taking advantage of a sick old man to do so. Hello. 
자네가 날 속이고 내 굿을 가져간 건 말이 되고 By falling into Eelnam's trap, Gihun is undermined his earlier selflessness, and Eelnam takes this as a victory. This dynamic naturally fits into the broader theme of Squid Game, which more than just being a criticism of capitalism, extends to be a deeper human story about selfishness versus selflessness. A theme embodied perfectly by how Ali acts in his own worst interest for the slim chance of saving both himself and Sangwoo, and how Sangwoo throws him under the bus to survive, just like the glassmaker and Sabiok. Just like the clues that Ilnam isn't who he says he is, Gihun's inner tug of war between selfishness and selflessness runs through most of the show. In the beginning, he's an arsehole to his mum, and he leeches money off her to gamble. But he ends up using what little is left of that money to get his daughter a birthday present. When he's running away from the loan sharks, he even stops to hand Sabiok's drink back to her. Which is likely a contributing factor to him getting caught in the end. And in the games, Gihun's behaviour swivels to become downright heroic. His criticism of Sangwoo's anything goes attitude cements Gihun as believing that even in dire circumstances, there are chances to look after the people around you and not always act in your own best interests. And that outlook lands Gihun and Eelnam with two very different worldviews. And that's why the Eelnam twist had to happen. Because the Squid Game doesn't end when Sangwoo puts the knife in his neck. The Squid Game is explained to the competitors as being a series of six games, but that's not actually true. There are nine games that take place in the show. Red Light Green Light, The Dalgona Game, The Nighttime Attack, Tug of War, The Marbles Game, The Glass Bridge, The After Dinner Knife Game, The One on One Squid Game, and finally, The Homeless Man Game. Despite being the least intense and violent of the games, this is by far the most important one, because it's the final conflict, not between people, but between ideologies. Because despite losing his way to Ilnam in the Marbles game, Gihun recaptures some of that selflessness before the game is over. He's ready to give up all that money to save Sangwoo, a guy he's come to fucking despise. And because of the survivor's guilt he carries, he refuses to touch the money that's rightfully his, which further undermines Ilnam's beliefs. <laughs> Even the way Eelnam gets back in touch with Gihun is crucial, because the lady with the flowers doesn't just hand him Eelnam's greeting card. It's yet another of Eelnam's tests. In handing over the cash, Gihun proves himself to still be the kind of person that Eelnam is afraid of. And the final match begins. This gamble carries all the intensity of the other games and more. It's not having faith in a horse, or the claw. It's not even having faith in yourself. It's having faith in people, despite everything Gihun's witnessed in the show. The natural selfishness that Ilnam banked on doesn't show itself. In losing this final game, Ilnam is cemented not as a heinous villain who takes pleasure in suffering, but as a pathetic old man unable to change his convictions, trapped in a hell of his own beliefs. And in victory, Gihun's faith in people is rewarded. He's able to accept a lot of things about his own situation, and is able to carry both selflessness and selfishness with him in a healthy balance, only taking the money he feels he has any right to, and leaving the rest with the people that Sangwoo and Sabiok left behind. And this is the first of several acts of selflessness that Gihun performs after the Homeless Man game. When he spots the recruiter playing Duck G with another hapless contender, he races to put it to a stop, and keeps the guy from getting suckered in like he did. <laughs> and I've heard some people say that they think deciding not to travel to America to be with his daughter is a selfish act, that it's stupid of him to just give everything up right at the end. 
but the pre-established dynamic of selflessness versus selfishness proves this to be the complete opposite. In wanting to be close to his daughter, gi is doing something for himself. It's not like his daughter's been left in some horrible orphanage and he has to rescue her. She's doing perfectly fine with her mum and stepdad. So in going to America, gi would be performing a selfish, albeit harmless act. It's only deciding that fighting against the continuing Squid Game and denying himself his daughter that gi performs his most selflessly heroic act yet, giving up everything to help others. And how fitting that at the end of a series so jam-packed with treachery, lies and bloodshed, the final act of Squid Game is sacrifice. I'll say it one last time, I fucking adore Squid Game. Putting together this video has reminded me of loads of brilliant wee bits I'd forgotten. It wasn't just a flash in the pan for me, it's something I've taken a lot of inspiration from and I'm beyond excited to see where it goes next. I hope this video has helped you to see things my way, especially if you came in thinking the show had a weak ending. If there were any problems with the show that really mattered to you that I didn't mention here, feel free to let me know. I'm happy for the conversation to continue and I'm open to listening to perspectives on the show that I haven't heard yet. And aside from that, all that's left to do is await series 2. It might be a total disappointment that fails to live up to the first, but it might be even better. Come on, one last gamble.